Well, good morning, everyone. I've simply got the task of uh, organising the more or leading the morning prayer. So uh, it will begin shortly with some a bit of reflective music uh, that will hopefully uh, take us from whatever is in our heads into a more uh, a, a better than we already are disposition for prayer. And if you have a copy that has a highlighted bit on it, you are the person deputed to read that antiphon or to read that particular intercession or piece of scripture. So there's absolutely no argument with that. It's a dictatorial, <laughs> autocratic uh, imposition on your freedom. But uh, that's how we're, we're organising this this morning. Uh, and we'll divide ourselves roughly aligned with this candle. So if you're on this side of it, you're that half of the choir when we recite the psalms. And if you're on this side of it, you're on that half of it. So you just follow the lead of whoever the random uh, antiphona is for uh, that particular psalm or canticle. We won't have a problem with that. Well, let's always remind ourselves that we're, we're constantly in the presence of God. This is most of the time, if you're like me, easily distracted and forget that. So let's remind ourselves of that by using the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. How good, How good to thank, thank, you, thank you, Lord, to praise your name most high, to sing your love and dawn, your faithfulness to us, with sound of lyre and harp, with music of the Lord, for your word brings the light, your deeds It is good to make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning. And put a new spirit within you. I will draw you from the nations. Gather you from exile and bring you home. I will wash you in fresh water, bring you from the world of and make you clean again. Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to St. John Vianney. This is a very special day um, when the Anglicans and Catholics gather together um, and we join in celebrating the life of St. Francis of Assisi, um, the charism that we all follow. Um, I thank you for being here. It's really great that so many of us could gather in, in, in such large numbers. Um, we've had a rocky journey the last few years, so to be back together like this and you know, joining is, is really wonderful. Um, I'll give my thanks to everybody at the end. I hope you all have a really lovely day and uh, I look forward to meeting and talking with most of you and coming, that coming together again. Thank you. And um, Paul, am I passing over to you to yes. introduce the now, So, um, uh, welcome here today and uh, I think we'll just jump into our program. So first, from now uh, until however long it takes, we'll have the Hillsborough fraternity leading us in seven Franciscan saints or peacemakers, we hope. And then um, Brother Philip will take us to lunchtime then with some more talk about peacekeeping, if we have the time for that. Then lunch, 12.30 to 
and then our Anglican brothers and sisters are going to uh, treat us to a performance about the book of Gubbio and uh, peace and talk about peace with creation and um, the wider animal kingdom and the rest of creation. So welcome everybody and uh, look forward to, to chatting with you and catching up with you later. Thank you for presenting to you five saints as fruit peace makers. So we've got Margaret, if you'd like to come and sit up here, Margaret. She's talking about the St. Francis of Assisi. Aileen. I'm just going to, um, I was actually going to pray you, pray, pray for you for some music, make me a channel of your peace. And I couldn't get it on and um, I, I, I couldn't get my computer into the internet with the internet, so I think we'll just have to leave that, but we all really know it pretty well. Um, all of these people are going to present to you a little talk, just a little short explanation of their particular saint and why they are a peacemaker. And um, at the end of each one, we can have one or two questions, if any of you want to ask any questions. Um, or make any comments, but we can't have them in more than in more than three. I think we have to cap it at that. Um, there's going to be a follow-up activity, which I'll tell you about when we're finished. So we're going to start first with Margaret. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'll begin my reflection with um, a little introduction from Keith Warner who um, wrote Care for Creation. And this is the role of secular Franciscans in society. As secular Franciscans, we cannot commit ourselves to live, live the gospel according to Franciscan spirituality in our own secular state. We are called to make our own contribution, inspired by the person and message of our seraphic Father Francis, towards a world in which dignity of the human person, shared responsibility and peace and love may be living realities. Let us give thanks to our God and Father, our brother and redeemer, Jesus, and the, holy, and the spirit of love for the holy charism that was poured forth by our seraphic Father Francis. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking about St. Clair of Assisi, um, most of you probably know most of the aspects of her life, but just briefly, she was born to a noble family in Assisi. Um, there seems to be a little bit of an argument as to the year, but around the year 19, 1193 to 94. The youngest of three daughters, her sister Agnes and Beatrix being younger. Um, just skipping right through, she had a um, very privileged uh, childhood, lived in a, a palace, and um, her mother was very, very spiritual and kind to those um, who had less than they did. Her father, on the other hand, was a businessman, and she watched him um, and her uncle, also very wealthy, they were in the Maori or Majori class of people, um, and they had a lot of um, power and influence, and she saw that actually instead of being happy, they were actually concerned about their money and how, how that they would retain that money and make more money, and even to the effect in those days of people making marriages with their children so that their power and standing would be maintained. So um, she was um, at around 11 years of age. Um, uh, they, uh, he found a suitor for her, but she rejected and said that she wanted that she would marry later if she were to marry. Um, but by 18, she'd made her mind up that the suitor that was chosen for her would not, she would not be going to marry. So, um, at around that age, she heard Francis of Assisi pe preach his Lenten homilies in the church of San Giorgio. She was deeply moved and became determined to live out the gospel message in a radical way.
Francis. Venture was born in uh, 1221. He was christened Giovanni. He told him version of John. And he was born six years before Sir Francis died. He became very ill as a child, and in response to the pleading of the child's mother, the saint prayed for John's recovery from a dangerous illness. And foreseeing the future greatness of the little John, cried out, O Viurna Ventura, O good fortune, which became Bonaventure. Age 22, he entered the Franciscan order. Having made his vows, he was sent to Paris to complete his studies under the celebrated Dr. Alexander of Hales, an Englishman and a Franciscan. The latter's inclination, the honour of having it first conferred upon him. And like St. Thomas Aquinas, he enjoyed the friendship of the Holy King, St. Louis. In 1835, he was chosen general of his order and restored a perfect calm where peace had been disturbed by internal dissensions. I tried to read up on that, and I must confess I just about needed a dictionary to understand some of the words using it. There was one branch of the Franciscans were going on a path away, almost away from Jesus to something else. And he quietly, with Mana, brought them all back to a peaceful end. He was then nominated as Archbishop of York. And that really hit me because I've been to York and I've stood in the York minister. Pope Clement nominated him, but he begged not to be forced to, to, be forced to accept that dignity. Gregory obliged him to take upon himself a greater one, that of Cardinal and Bishop of Albana, one of the six suffragan sees of Rome. And before his death, he abdicated, he abdicated his office of General of the Franciscan Order and died while he was assisting at the Second Council of Leons in July 15, 1274. Several times he died suddenly at the conference and it was thought he was poisoned but I've, again there's, there's a lot I haven't read but right. I've seen no if that I think the probably in that day and age poisoning was one way of getting rid of your enemies when we disagreed it was commonplace and, and I think the fact that he died suddenly made people think oh he must have been poisoned could that have been also since he was so skilled and so varied in his thinking it could have been human jealousy. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there might be for doing it. Could be, you know, tall poppy syndrome, this man's... It could, have, it. it could have just been food poisoning. <laughs> 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 and I, I actually read that he was a that the tradition always sets one model and then they draw, you know, other people follow on from the tradition. Benedict, St. Benedict was actually, he was actually threatened with death through poison. One of his own monks tried to poison him. Mm -hmm. And so you can get other saints drawn into this sort of way. But I think the really wonderful thing about Bonaventura is when they came to tell him that he was cardinal, they, um, they said to him, there they came, they had some emissaries come from Rome and um, they found him in the kitchen doing the dishes. I think that's a peacemaker, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, did you and want to the, say something? Um, one interesting little bit left, uh, I mentioned the paper, the Claire being patron saint of, of TV, etc. For what it's worth, a man of peace, man working Bonaventure is patron saint of bowel disorders. I'm happy to talk about Margaret of Cortona because many years ago I was very lucky to visit Cortona and to see her shrine, which is in a church 
high on the hill above Cortona. Um, now, what I'm saying are notes taken from a book called The Franciscan Story by Morris Carmody. Margaret's date of birth is unknown, but she lived during the second half of the 13th century. And details of her life are found in a book called Legend by Gionta Bevnagati. Now, he was a Franciscan friar living in Cortona, and he was also her confessor. And so the story of her life includes interesting details about the life of the Franciscan friars and their involvement with the people of Cortona too. She came from a reasonably well-off peasant family, but her mother died when she was only eight. And her father's second wife appears to have had little affection for her or her younger brother. At the age of 15, Margaret fell in love with a wealthy young man and she left home to join him. And they were partners for nine happy years, but it came to a, an abrupt end when he died. And at that time, she had a seven-year-old son. And because she wasn't a wife, she had no claim on her partner's estate. So she tried to return home, but sadly, she wasn't made welcome there. Now, what she'd done is, is more or less accepted nowadays, but in those days, it was very scandalous. At any rate, not being made welcome at home, she moved to Cortona and she was given a room in the house of two wealthy women, uh, Marinara Moscari and her daughter-in-law. When she got there, she repented bitterly of her sins and she began to express her sorrow with harsh penances, fasting, seldom eating meat, sleeping on the floor, praying during the night and whipping herself. She dirtied her face with soot to atone for the beauty that she felt had led her astray. She believed that this self-violence would bring her closer to Christ, who had suffered so much for her on the cross. And so love for the crucified Christ was the heart of her spirituality. She had to support herself and her son, and so she worked as a midwife for the women of the nobility. During this time, she sought confession and advice from the friars minor, and she asked to be admitted to the order of penance which was what our order was known at that time. They held back for a while, but they allowed her to join in 1276. She then dressed in a penitential tunic with a simple check pattern, tied it with a Franciscan cord. Um, Louis the Ninth. Yes. <laughs> King Louis the Ninth. Pope Boniface. I've only got scrap paper because I got it on the internet and I had trouble reading man writing at the time. No, I haven't got a printer and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Pope Boniface the, uh, the eighth proclaimed the canonization of Louis in 1297. He's the only French king to be declared a saint. Louis the ninth is often considered the model of the ideal Christian monarch. He was born in 1214, was king of France from 1226 to 1270. He consolidated the crown's control over the great lords, proved his passion for the justice, and went on for two, two crusades. King Louis led a crusade, this is the middle 1200s. He died during another crusade in the 1270, and the Catholic Church made him a saint to honour his crusades. That's what got down as to honour his crusade, which is to me quite unusual, but that's why it got down. St. Denis, however, is the patron saint of France, which I didn't know, and King Louis IX 
and Elizabeth Hungary are both our Franciscan role models. Now they do cross over qu quite a bit around that 1200 period. It was quite interesting because I was a bit ignorant about our King Louis the Ninth and didn't know. I presume because I've got the pleasure of of Saint Elizabeth Hungary that the, the Louis the Fourth was one. I didn't know about Ninth until I actually started doing a bit of research on that one. So, but the other thing was that Louis, this is uh, Louis the Fourth, uh, Elizabeth's uh, husband. He also went on a crusade under Frederick the Second. And he died of plague on the way, so that's how that sort of crosses over. Yes, you can see right. why yeah. you, that, that, that sort of thing happened, actually. Yeah. And Elizabeth, of course, she used dowry, and, and there's very similar things. She's out the hospital, and so yeah. it's very interwoven that, that particular yeah. period. And that's and I don't know myself. I've got a brother who's uh, Dennis, who was a priest, but he's actually the Dennis. That's where he we got his thing because it, when we got uh, confirmed our confirmations. Like I said, Michael the Arch and I found out only recently about Michael the Archangel was in his relationship to Italy you know, only a few nights ago when we were at our thing there. And I've got a younger brother called Francis, I've got Francis, so yeah, I found out I'm very enough not mine, so I can't think of it. They're holding so it's more Welsh than anything else. But you've got a brother either side of me which you know, which uh, actually uh, both have more nobility or more saint sainthood and family sort of thing there. So that was quite interesting. And uh, St. Louis, the St. Louis feast day is that uh, August the 25th, so it's only a month away basically. He died near Tunisia and uh, is canonised on August the 11th, 1297. One of 12 children born into extreme poverty in the tenants of Dublin Ireland. His father was a heavy drinker who could not provide for his family, so he moved them from place to place. As a result, Matt attended formal school only from the ages of 11 to 12 and could not read or write. When Matt was 12, he got his first job as a delivery boy for a beer bottling company and also took his first drink. <laughs> this unhealthy combination seemed to seal his fate. By the time he was 16, Matt was a confirmed alcoholic. He was spending all his money on alcohol and not supporting his family who remained desperately poor. Matt recalled that he reached his lowest point when he and his brothers stole a fiddler from a blind street player and mm. sold it for the price of a drink. Mm. While these hardly seem like the actions of a man on his way to sainthood, God had another plan. One fateful Saturday afternoon, after 12 years of hard drinking, Matt found himself without a job, without a drink, and without a friend to help him get one. As he was walked home that day, he experienced a moment of intense grace. He suddenly saw with intense clarity his mind and heart had been wasting his life. In his heart that he had been wasting his life at the age of 28. 
He saw himself for what he truly was, a fool who had nothing to show for his life. By the time he reached home, Matt had made the decision to quit drinking. That very day, he walked to Dublin Seminary and made his confession to a priest who helped him take the pledge to renounce alcohol for three months. He returned after six months and then made the pledge for life, but it was not easy. There were no 12-step programs or counsel or support groups to help him. Nevertheless, Matt maintained severity through a recovery program that centered on daily mass, devotion to the Eucharist, love for Mary and spiritual reading. He learned to read so that he could read the Bible. After his conversion, he lived life of quiet devotion, holiness, and extreme generosity in spirit and material goods. In the midst of the flourishing city life that swirled around him, he, he worked for the charity and he, any money he made, he, he gave back to the people that he had taken from. Well, I'd prepare myself. <laughs> <laughs> Th thank, thank you, Joe. Um, sorry, I had a 20-page uh, dissertation with about six open-ended questions. I left it at home. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the thing is, um, Blessed Carlo Acutis is seen as the first saint of our new millennium. He was very tech-savvy, so an honour to him. I'm doing the thing on the cell phone. <laughs> um, Blessed Carlos Acutis was born on May the 3rd, 1991, and died on October the 12th, 2006. He was born in London and raised in Milan. Carlo's wealthy parents were not particularly religious. Upon receiving his first communion at age seven, Carlo became a frequent communicant, making a point of praying before the tabernacle before or after every mass. In addition to Francis of Assisi, Carlo took several of the younger saints as his models, including Bernadette Subiru. Uh, excuse me, sorry? You know that one? Um, can someone please confirm? I think that's uh, St. Bernadette of Lourdes, that's who I knew him. And Jacinta and Francisco Mato, again, two of the children of Fatima who died during the Spanish influenza epidemic and Dominic Savio. So at school, Carlo tried to comfort friends whose parents were undergoing divorce, as well as stepping in to defend disabled students from bullies. After school hours, he volunteered his time with the city's homeless and destitute. Considered a computer geek by some, Carlo spent four years creating a website dedicated to cataloguing every reported Eucharistic miracle around the world. He also enjoyed films, comics, soccer, and playing popular video games. Diagnosed with leukemia, Carlo offered his sufferings to God for the intentions of the sitting Pope, Benedict XVI, and the entire church. His longtime desire to visit as many sites of Eucharistic miracles as possible was cut short by his illness. Carlo died in 2006 and was beatified in 2020. As he had wished, Carlo was buried in Assisi at St. Mary Major's Chapel of the Stripping, where Francis had returned his clothes to his father and began a more radical following of the gospel. Among the thousands present for Carlo's beatification at Assisi's Basilica of St. Francis were many of his childhood friends. Presiding at the beatification service, Cardinal Agostino Villini praised Carlo as an example of how young people can use technology to spread the gospel to reach as many people as possible and help them know the beauty of friendship with the Lord. 
his liturgical feast is celebrated on October the 12th. Now I'm going to try something here in the whole spirit of what um, Blessed Carlo tried to do uh, and or, or did accomplish and that's make the gospel direct the gospel and direct the charism of Francis in a sort of more <coughs> tech savvy manner. So we'll give this a go. I haven't rehearsed it, but Father Greg Friedman is going to talk about Carlo Acutis and the power of the privilege. together for second language speakers, particularly for Melanesia, so that they could understand some good stories about Francis in Melanesia, and they were sent over there, and unfortunately one load of books, or 90 books I think, never, worked, never got there. So, um, but it's in the simplicity that there's quite a powerful message, hopefully, for anyone. So we will now have an attempt to I'm not, I'm okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not, not tired. I'd like to see them. Just bring, bring them in. <laughs> Welcome. Peace be to you. We have come to tell you about the fierce wolf in Gabbio because we're all terrified. There's not much peace here at the moment and we're wondering, Father Francis, whether there's anything you can do to help us. They have sent us to ask you to come. We didn't know what else to do because everybody's very scared. Gabbio, not the place where they've seen that. Yes. Well, come in, come in, come in, come in, sit down. Yes, uh, tell us all about it. So, uh, uh, oh, brother, um, he's thirsty. He's got some water for him to drink. Been coming out into the open, Father Francis, 
And last week he came right up to the gates of Gubbio. He's taken a goat and a stray dog. Oh, no. And then everybody, and so everybody's really frightened. And then now, last week, um, yes, yesterday, he attacked one of the men who was working on his land outside the gates. And so we're terrified for our children. And now the men have told us not to go out of the village. Not that anyone wants to, but the wolf is around. But we've got cocks to bring in and families to feed and eggs and cloth to take to the market in the nearest town. We don't know what to do, Francis. That wolf will kill somebody soon. He looks so thin and hungry and desperate. Can you do anything, Francis? I don't know what I can do at the moment, uh, but I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll come back with you and, uh, and, and see what see what happens. Not very far to go now, Father Francis. Over the next hill, and then we are there. You can see the wall now. And look, here's the gate. It looks very straight. Straight. Nobody is about. Francis has come back with us. in God. People of this town, do you promise to feed the, the wolf, brother wolf every day? Yes, yes we, we will. will. We will. Yes. This is the sign that brother wolf has promised not to harm anyone ever again. Two years later, in 
in Gabia. We did feed that wolf every single day. He even came through the gates to get his food. Not even the dogs were scared of him. He didn't hurt a single soul. And do you know what? The most amazing thing from that day on, not a single dog ever barked at it. People in Gavio were very moved by the brave efforts of Father Francis. And many more came to believe in God. Oh.